For disc herniation, the bulge has now torn all the way through, the annulus has torn, and a blob of the gel has squeezed through the crack and is out in, outside the disc at this point. That's called a herniated disc, a ruptured disc, prolapsed disc. There are many different terms used. Basically all mean the same thing. Slip disc is a misnomer because the disc doesn't slip out of place. It herniates. A blob of it squeezes out the tear. This cannot be manipulated back into place. It can't be sucked back into place with traction. This is very thick, viscous gel. It, it can't be sort of moved around. You can't sort of push this off the nerve. This can cause problems in more than one way. It can put direct pressure on the nerve as is seen here. This would be called a foraminal disc herniation because the, the extruded disc material is sitting in the nerve canal, the neural foramen. That's actually a relatively uncommon type of disc herniation. More often it's central, or what they call paracentral, which means just off to the side. There's a little more room, and it tends to not cause as much nerve compression under those circumstances. One of the things that's not appre widely appreciated when it comes to disc herniations, however, is the fact that the nuclear material, the gel, otherwise known as the nucleus, has enzymes or chemicals in it, specifically something called phospholipase A. It's, a, it's an antigen. And it's highly chemically irritating to the nerve roots. Normally that gel is sequestered inside the disc, but when you have a herniation, the gel doesn't have to be directly pressing on the disc, but just those enzymes and chemicals need to be floating around in the epidural space and come in contact with the nerve to get a hot chemical inflammation, almost like a contact dermatitis, if you will, of your hands. In that case, the person gets burning pain down the leg, and that's commonly referred to as sciatica. You shouldn't call buttock and leg pain sciatica unless you know that it's caused by inflammation of the sciatic nerve, for example, from a disc herniation or compression from stenosis, because there are many different conditions, including sacroiliac pain, and lumbar facet joint pain, which I'll talk about next, that can cause very similar symptoms. For example, from the uh, spine textbook, this, this is two examples. One is sacroiliac pain and one is a lumbar disc herniation, and you can see that they have a very similar uh, pain diagram, pain pattern. Uh, with sciatica from disc herniation, it's important to understand that, there, that when one has pain, there's a chemical inflammation. And so the foundation for treatment for that is anti-inflammatory medication. This can be taken by mouth with over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. It can be given in terms of prednisone or other types of cortisone pills to reduce inflammation. Or it can be delivered by means of spinal injection under x-ray guidance or fluoroscop fluoroscopic guidance to specifically target um, the nerve root, to bathe the nerve root in the the um, anti-inflammatory medicine. When a nerve root is inflamed, it becomes swollen and irritated, and what the cortisone does, or the anti-inflammatory medicine does, is it shrinks the swelling down out of the nerve. It reduces and reverses the inflammatory changes. It does not simply mask the pain as some people think. The other thing is it's not necessary to do cortisone injections, which are called epidurals, in a series of three. That's kind of an old-fashioned approach. We basically do one and see how it goes. If somebody comes back and they're satisfied with the pain reduction, then um, a second one does not have to be done unless the person's uh, not happy with the residual level of pain. The natural history of disc herniation, in other words, what happens if you don't treat a disc herniation and you just sort of follow it and see what happens, is that it will shrink down over time. Your body will coat the, the herniated portion of the disc with granulation tissue, which is basically white blood cells, which secrete enzymes that help to dissolve the disc herniation. It's important to remember, however, however as I said about with the bulging discs, is that the disc does not have the ability to repair itself. So the annulus remains torn. You have a weakened spot in the wall of the disc, and it's possible to re-herniate the same disc. In other words, to do something to squeeze another blob of gel out. Again, this is where learning core strengthening and lumbar stabilization are so critical. You can help somebody with a disc herniation by, for example, doing an epidural or giving them a course of prednisone 
but unless you teach that person prevention, you really haven't done your full job as, as a physician. So I spent a lot of time personally teaching patients core strengthening and especially lumbar stabilization. And again, I'll clarify in a little bit what's the difference between those two, because they're really two sides of the same coin. But that's really the key to prevention. And also avoiding doing things that can re-aggravate the disc. The two most aggravating things are twisting through the waist and bending over at the waist, especially pulling or picking up something heavy or reaching over with something heavy, pick the baby up out of the crib or take something out of the trunk of the car. That puts a lot of leverage on the back. Realize that the distance between your hands to the low back is a lever arm. And if you're picking up something that weighs 30 pounds, but it's a five foot lever arm, that's like putting that weight at the end of a five foot crowbar, you get a lot of force out the other end.